Should I start? Start. Okay. everyone. I'd like to welcome you to uh, the program this morning. My name is Nancy Lamond. I'm with AARP. We're an organization of over 38 million people over the age of 50, and perhaps some of you have even gotten some mail from us at one point or another. We're delighted to be here. As you can imagine, we do a lot of work on health care and a lot of work with the Congress, so we're pleased to uh, be an underwriter of this event and to have the opportunity to uh, introduce this session. Our hope, uh, as a group that deals with Congress a lot, is that this distance from Washington, D.C. and this high altitude is going to be able to provide a wonderful perspective. So with that, I want to turn the, uh, turn the attention over to Julie Robner and uh, the, pro the program for this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for being here. Thank you to the schedulers. I'm moderating three panels today, none of them opposite the soccer game. So I appreciate that very much. Our challenge today this morning is mostly to not depress you uh, by telling you that Congress is thoroughly dysfunctional and appears likely to stay that way for the foreseeable future, no matter who wins this November. Although I have to say that's kind of the conventional wisdom in Washington these days, particularly when it comes to just about anything health related. Um, but we have a trio of most esteemed former members who I'm sure can convince us why things may not be quite as hopeless as the conventional wisdom suggests. After all, the conventional wisdom was sure Eric Cantor would win his primary now, wasn't it? So let us get right to it. Here's how we're going to do this. I will briefly introduce our guests if you want to know more about them, and they are all tremendously accomplished. Their full bios are available in your books or on the website. We will begin with each panelist giving a short introductory statement to get us going. Then the panel and I will chat amongst ourselves for a few minutes, and then I will let the audience have at them. So we are honored to have with us this morning not one, but two former Senate Majority Leaders. Tom Daschle, on my left, served in the Senate as a Democrat from South Dakota from 1987 until 2005. He served as Majority Leader from 2001 to 2003 and led the minority both before and after that, and actually during part of 2001, but that's now congressional trivia. Today, he's Senior Advisor at the law firm DLA Piper and Board Chair at the Center for American Progress, among other activities. Mickey Edwards, here on my right, served in the House as a Republican from Oklahoma from 1997 to 1992, where he served in the House leadership as well as on both the Budget and Appropriations Committees. Today, he works for our host, the Aspen Institute, as Vice President and Director of the Rodell Fellowship in Public Leadership Program. Finally, we have on my left Dr. Bill Frist, who served in the Senate as a Republican from Tennessee from 1995 until 2007 and as Majority Leader from 2003 until his departure. He was the first and so far, I believe, only physician to hold that position. Today, he's Chairman of the Executive Council of the healthcare private equity firm Cressy & Company and an adjunct professor of surgery at Vanderbilt, where you may remember he was transplant surgeon before being elected to the Senate. Uh, full disclosure, Senator Frist also sits on the board of the Kaiser Family Foundation, which is my employer now. So without further ado, I turn things over to Senator Dash. Well, Julie, thank you, and thank you for the great service you provided uh, those many years at NPR and still provide with both NPR and the Kaiser Family Foundation. I, I, it is conventional wisdom that uh, we're in a very dysfunctional state in Washington, arguably the most dysfunctional we've uh, witnessed, uh, at least in recent history. Uh, two, two illustrations of that, when Lyndon Johnson was majority leader, there was literally one filibuster in six years, and that was the filibuster over the Civil Rights Act of 1957. Over the last six years, there have been 422 filibusters. Um, uh, our Republican colleagues in the Senate uh, uh, argue that one of the big reasons why there are so many filibusters is that over the last year, they've only been allowed nine amendments on the Senate floor. Uh, that's unprecedented as well. So there's an enormous amount of frustration. And in large measure, it's an ideological uh, chasm that, uh, that separates Republicans from Democrats and liberals from conservatives, largely over the role of government today. I like to call it the noise of democracy. It's not very stereophonic, not very concordant. Uh, it beats the alternatives, the noise of violence on the streets of Syria or uh, no noise at all where you're thrown in prison for expressing your views, but that's a pretty low bar. Uh, the real question is how do we get around it? And I, I think it's more than just ideological. It's the way the culture of the Congress has evolved over the last 20 years. I blame the airplane in part uh, because the airplane now has 
allowed for members of Congress to leave on Thursdays, to come back on Tuesdays, and try to govern on Wednesdays. And uh, you simply can't do that. They don't know each other as well. I blame in part the money race. A typical United States senator today has to raise $15,000 a day for every day he or she is in office. They don't do that, so they, at the last two years, spend about two-thirds or three-fourths of their time doing nothing but raising money. I do it with, because I, I, I'm concerned as well about the primary process and how people are more concerned about losing a primary than they are about running in a general election these days. So all of those factors have contributed greatly. As it relates to healthcare, and I'll close with this because I know we have a lot to talk about, I'm actually a little more optimistic that on healthcare over the longer term there are areas for which there will be consensus. When I talk to my Republican friends, there's no debate that we have a cost problem. There's no debate that we have a real quality issue or that we have challenges having to do with access. I think you could even assert that there's general agreement about the goal. We want to build a high performance, high value healthcare marketplace with better access, better quality, and lower cost. There isn't disagreement about that. There's even agreement on what the causes of those problems are. I'm involved with a, a coalition to try to increase the, the opportunities for telehealth and uh, the ways we can use telemedicine. And I'm really surprised at the enthusiasm I find on both sides of the aisle. There are quiet discussions going on that I'm very encouraged by, and hopefully over time, this noise of democracy will get a little more quiet, and the dysfunction will end, and we'll be able to do some good things for this country. But I look forward to the panel. Congressman, if you, could, if you call yourself that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I do, actually. I, I have uh, great admiration for the Congress and for our constitutional system that puts most of the real uh, final decision-making authority in the Congress. The, um, you, you could actually describe what's happening as dysfunctional in that it, it doesn't get much done uh, and functional in that it, uh, the people who are in the Congress are operating according to the political system we've created, not the constitutional system, but the political system. So as Tom says, people are mostly concerned about uh, their primary opponents. We have a system now in in 46 states, uh, if you lose your uh, primary uh, or convention, nominating convention, uh, even no matter how small the turnout, if there were 30,000 people you know, voting for the winner or uh, uh, in a state of 26 million like, uh, like Texas where uh, somebody, you know, Ted Cruz got less than 700,000 votes in the primary, but you know, they, David Dewhurst was not able to run in the general. 46 states, the person who lost in the primary doesn't get to be on the ballot. Uh, by law, uh, in November, uh, we let the, um, uh, the majorities in the state legislatures in 37 states draw congressional district lines. And so what's happened is that you have a Congress that is representative, but it's a representative of the people who participate in their party primaries. And they're busy looking over their shoulder, not at the general electorate. So, that, so there are some fundamental changes that need to be made in the political system, uh, the election system, if we're going to uh, change things. But I also would say at the same time, the people that I know who are serving in Congress are for the most part uh, as intelligent, as thoughtful, as caring, uh, as committed to uh, the country's welfare as, as those who went before. But as Tom points out, there's less opportunity for them to get to know each other as human beings. So they represent only you know, my ideology or your ideology. If I were, uh, I served in the House with Tom before he went to, uh, to the Senate had great high regard for him. Uh, if, if, if he and I were both in the house today, we wouldn't know each other. I would just see that guy across the aisle and know that he belonged to the other political party. And so the way we've set things up now, he's the enemy. You know, he's not Tom with a family, you know, but, but he, he's the enemy. And that's something we have to break through. But I, you know, like Tom, I, I have some optimism. Um, uh, I look at the Affordable Care Act and, and the uh, incessant attempts to uh, repeal it, uh, and there's a, it's a, lot part, a lot of parts of it that are unpopular uh, in the country, but changing the healthcare system is very much an incremental prog problem. The, uh, uh, the first national health care bill was introduced in 1920. Uh, when Harry Truman wrote his memoirs, he said that his greatest single disappointment was failure to get a national health care program uh, passed. But by 1965, there was national health care for the poor and for the elderly. And then, you know, for, you know, a little by little children and, and, and uh, 
uh, you know, pharmaceutical coverage. So I, I think that one of the things that's going to happen, regardless of who uh, controls the uh, White House or the Congress, some of the changes that were made in the Affordable Care Act are going to remain. Uh, for example, requiring insurance companies uh, to cover pre-existing conditions or allowing young adults to stay longer on their parents' uh, health insurance because I think Republicans, too, you know, have bought into the idea that those are, those are good advances. Uh, I, I think, let me just end with this. There, there's another part here, and that's what, could, what can Congress do about health care, not about the health care legislation. Most members of the House and Senate uh, are pretty in, much, much invisible to most of the country. You just don't know, I, I bet most of you could not, you know, name the two senators from, you know, I could pick almost any state, uh, or, or the members of Congress, but they're very well known and, and pretty popular for the most part in their own communities. And that is a great tool to be able to use with uh, a, you know, they create caucuses about everything. There's a Rust Belt caucus, there's a, every kind of a caucus. Uh, and getting members of Congress to commit themselves to health improvement so that you have uh, not a nanny state saying, you know, have less sodium in your food, but you have your local members of Congress, House and Senate, you know, putting together campaigns to reward kids who make improvements and so forth. I think tapping into the, the Congress itself to take the lead in trying to improve the health of the, of the American people could be very effective. Julie, thanks, and it's, it's great. I'm honored to really be on this panel. Um, in part, in large part, we're good friends, but in large part because if we don't uh, solve this issue, take it above, step back above health care of a dysfunctional Congress, um, we really lose a lot of the greatness of America and the dynamism, the flexibility and the American dream and better hope for our children, which we don't have today. And uh, Mickey, I hope we will come back to it a little bit, but both Tom and Mickey mentioned a, something you probably don't think very much about. but. We have Congress, which is 535 people like us at, at different points in our lives that are elected by you, and yet the Congress is sort of the entity out there is not trusted, is disliked, alienation, and the like. So what was both mentioned by both of them is the electoral process. How can you capture the intimacy of, of the voter with the, with the elected officials so that your views are, are, are uh, reflected? It's not discussed. The newspapers don't write about it, or, and people like Mickey study it. But in some way, we need to leave conferences like this to reattach what was immediacy and intimacy between the voter, and not in every day, but in terms of the electoral process. And the optimism, because unfortunately or unfortunately, I'm going to be a little optimistic, too, when we finish, because I have so much confidence in, in the American people. But we, have to, we do have to fix the institutional What's, what's evolved is institutional um, straitjacketing in this electoral process. We, I don't know if we're going to be talking any more about that, but I want to just reiterate because both of them mentioned it. I, let me just start with the larger picture um, of the two big sort of clouds that hang over uh, Washington. And by Washington, I mean Congress, but also the president and, and administration, and, and in particular Congress. And there are two that I see, and, and one is, is alienation. And alienation is, is, in many ways, in society today broadly. We're talking about alienation against the Congress today in part, but the, the broader picture um, really reflects this, this alienation which we feel in society. If you look at the uh, recent Wall Street Journal poll, overall confidence in the institution that really makes America great historically, the United States Congress is at 7%. And if you look at the recent um, MSNBC or NBC Wall Street Journal poll, and you look at overall confidence in institutions broadly, broadly, forget the United States Congress, um, America doesn't have or feels separate from that, those institutions. And for all, if you list, list 34 institutions and you say among the American people, there are only two that fall above the 50% level that you took half of this room, there are only two that you, 50% of you would check off, and you, you can guess what they might be. Healthcare is down at the, I mean, uh, Congress is obviously down at the bottom, but there are only two at the very top or above 50%, and it is our military, which we are all so proud of. It makes us being here possible. 
and uh, number two, the sort of high-tech industry, which is interesting out there. But everybody else falls below the 50%. So the macro environment that we have to address this is one of, of alienation. And it's a cultural thing, and how we change cultural goes beyond how we debate health care, and, and we can make it worse by how we debate health care and how we pass health care, but it's going to be beyond that. The second big one, and that's sort of a conflict or a crisis in, um, in confidence. The second big cloud that hangs out there, and it's not a cloud, but it's just ever, I think of it, because when you look up, it's just always, it's like the mountains around you, is, um, is uh, today, is this populism. And so the, uh, Julie mentioned uh, the Eric Cantor's race, and you look at Thad Cochran's race from while well, we've been out here in the last two days. And the populism is interesting. It's, it's that my interests are not reflected by the other body, are not being reflected by, by Congress, and therefore I as an individual or my community has the opportunity to, to act. The populism today, it is powerful. We, say, we immediately think of the Tea Party, the sort of associated Republican, but the Democrats have, have their own populism. It's not quite as discreet. We can come back and talk about that, but don't think just Tea Party when you think populism. You think this distrust. If you look at Eric's, Eric Cantor's race, which surprised everybody, a lot of money Republican district, threw out the leader of, of, of sort of Republican thought at the time. It was in the post and the exit polls, it was because of this, this populist view of anti-Wall Street. He's too close to Wall Street. He's too close to the financial community. And people in that Republican district spoke, and Thad Cochran, the same sort of thing. The populism manifested in a less government, lower taxes, Tea Party movement again there. So I don't want to overstate it, but if you put alienation out there and you put the populism out there, it reflects a lot. We're going to spend most of our time today talking about health care and how those are reflected there, and also how you change the institution that Tom had the opportunity to leave and I lead, and I followed him in terms of leadership as well as the House of Representatives. Good, thank you. Yeah, and, there, and indeed, there is you know populism on the left. You can see it bubbling up and sort of the push for Elizabeth Warren to, to run for president. It's 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 both 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 parties are are flirting with with populist candidates, and you've got Rand Paul on our side and Elizabeth Warren, which I think is a perfect example of how much that pops up, how much it comes down, how healthy is it? I think it's very healthy, by the way, but but it is reflected on both sides. But certainly, I want, to talk, I want to talk about something in Congress that almost happened this year that I think a lot of people might have missed because it almost but didn't happen, and that's the, the SGR fix for Medicare. For those of you who don't know what that is, this is a, a continuing problem that dates back to 1997 on the Balanced Budget Act um, uh, with the way that Medicare pays doctors. And Were you a majority leader then? <laughs> <laughs> Were you in charge? No, I have to take part. No, but Tom Scully's over there, and he was, he was around oh, that's when right. this Maybe happened. You weren't. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and and Congress has been now, you know, trying trying to fix this and basically kicking the problem, you know, off uh, in in s smaller and smaller increments. Sometimes as as briefly as a month uh, since 2002. Uh, and they, you know, while they were busily sort of in public fighting about the Affordable Care Act, they were quietly and on a very bipartisan basis coming up with an actual fix for how Medicare is going to pay doctors um, based on value rather than volume. Um, it came out of the Energy and Commerce Committee on a 51 to 0 roll call vote in the middle of all this craziness about the Affordable Care Act. You had all the Democrats and all the Republicans vote for this unanimously. Then the Ways and Means Committee and the Finance Committee came up with, with their bills. They put them together. Meanwhile, this is half price. This is half as expensive as it used to be, according to the Congressional Budget Office, because as we've been hearing, health spending is going up not nearly as fast as it did. I mean, it was just a remarkable turn of events that they got the doctors all to, to agree to this, the American Medical Association, all the specialty groups. Everybody basically came to the table, said, yes, let's do this. The Democrats, the Republicans, the president, everybody came around. The only sticking point was they needed to come up with $140 billion, which, as we know, we have a $2.7 trillion health care bill. You know, how, that's how much we spend on health care. It was really not such hev a heavy lift, and yet, in the end, they couldn't find the money, and they just said, nope, we're not going to do it, kicked it off for another year. So the question becomes, is this a glass half empty or a glass half full? <laughs> it's that, you know, once again, Congress couldn't quite push it over the finish line. On the other hand, they had this remarkable effort amongst themselves. Does this bode well for the future, or is this yet another example of, nope, 
complete total congressional dysfunction. Well, let me, let me throw in one thing that based on, on uh, what uh, Tom and Bill already said, and that, that is that uh, you can't tell by looking, but I, I still work out at the house gym, and one of the great things about doing that uh, is that uh, I usually have the place to myself because you know members of Congress are all somewhere else, and, and even when you finding the money for something like this, find, finding the ability to do it, is difficult, and you can't do it in a Congress, especially in an election year, but not only in an election year, when, when they're gone. You know, they, they spend so few days actually on the Hill meeting with each other trying to do this. You know, if it's one day a week or two days a week, you can't do anything in your jobs one day or two days a week, and they can't either. Well, Julie, I, I agree with Mickey completely. I, the, the Congress is in session nine days a month this year. Um, some days not even nine days. August, they won't be in session for nine. And so that's, that's uh, I think we all agree, is really one of the biggest encumbrances. But I think the SGR debate is symptomatic of the larger challenge that Congress faces. There is a good deal of common ground. 51 to nothing is unheard of. You don't get a 51 to nothing vote on anything these days, but it was 51 to nothing. Uh, where they got hung up on was the offset. And I say symptomatic because it's the offset, whether you're talking about the gas tax for highways or whether you're talking about how I'm coming up with other mechanisms to, uh, to finance the debt. Uh, we've got to figure out a way to break through that, but that was the problem. And as you said, we got it at bargain basin price prices this year. So I'm, as I talk to members of Congress, I'm very encouraged that they're not going to let it go. They still think that there's a possibility of breaking through. But how do you find the offset, regardless of how the, the amount? I think it's going to have to include some sort of revenue and some sort of cut. Uh, that's the only way you can compromise on something like this. Uh, but. Uh, but we haven't seen the last word on SGR even this year. You know, I, I had a little to add I, I, because it, it, to me it reflects the fundamental issue. I think it's a good one to start with because Tom is right that people are working together more than you'd think when you, except for when you listen to you on NPR. <laughs> but it, you know, every, I, I everywhere did, else. I you did got, do this story, by the you, way. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. When you started introducing everybody, I said, that voice sounds familiar. <laughs> I think it is a fun, it really is a fundamental issue because you do have people working together. And Mickey's right, the average, the typical person who's in Senate and the House are, are smart, are, are well-meaning. As Tom said, the goals are out there the same. And the political process and the partisanship and all that, how do you, how do you get around it? And it really comes back to civil discourse, to listening uh, very carefully. And all that's not gonna happen, and this is the third the thing I'll add to the discussion, um, and that is it takes leadership and, and uh, um, it takes somebody standing up. The days of Lyndon Johnson are gone. You know, you think the majority leader has a lot of power, and it, it's like that old saying is that being majority leader is like being the groundskeeper at a cemetery. <laughs> you have a lot of people underneath you, but nobody's listening. <laughs> I say that because in, that's kind of what it is, but in truth, and I, again, I want to be critical of, of the leadership, of, of either party, but if a leader had come forward and said, this is a priority, you can come up with $140 billion. Um, uh, and so the leadership end of things, and Mickey, we were just talking beforehand, is teaching, teaches this leadership course here. I think um, that's something we can work on in, in the United States uh, Congress today. Number two thing about the SGR, because Tom and I as, as leaders and um, every year took the SGR to the floor and overrode it. SGR. Uh, overrode it. You probably did it four or five times. I did it four or five times, and that's good. But the, to override it, it becomes a huge issue with thousands and thousands of people coming to Washington and lobbying us and spending money, and and going on television. So a huge waste in in, in the system itself. It also, to me, demonstrates the danger of the United States Congress being overly prescriptive in putting formulas and making it law of the land especially now where the half-life of information and knowledge in IT is so, so short. The more Congress becomes prescriptive with a formula on how you're gonna get paid or how you're gonna get reimbursed or how much of this it is, the danger with that in this climate. And that was what, 10 years ago or 12 years ago, whatever it is today. And we need to be very careful as we go forward not to be writing that much prescription in actual formulas um, uh, into, into our legislation. So to go back to the ACA just for, for a second, I think everybody agrees, you know, in, in, normal, in a normal congressional environment, 
a law of that size would have had three, four rounds of technical corrections by now. I mean, that's how Congress works. You pass a big bill on anything, and then you find the things in it that you know weren't quite right, and obviously it passed in a sort of unusual way that given that there was no conference, because of course the Senate lost. Was it crammed majority. through or jammed <laughs> through? <laughs> it, there was no House Senate conference. It was not regular order, let us say. Um, and because Congress is so polarized on it, you've not been able to go back and do the kinds of you know, fixes that I think everybody agrees are warranted. So what's happened is obviously the administration has gone and done them unilaterally. Whether or not, even Democrats have been uncomfortable about this. A lot of people have written that the administration is overstepping its authority in a lot of these situations doing, making changes that, that people think, you know, there's a, a fairly wide consensus. It, probably doesn't have the authority to do. And now, of course, the news of the day is that the House Republicans are going to file a lawsuit saying that the, the administration is overstepping its legal authority. The administration says it's over, you know, the administration does, it says it's not overstepping its legal authority, but basically the administration says it's doing what it's doing because Congress can't act. So the question becomes, is Congress basically by in, in this state of gridlock abdicating some of its own power to the executive branch? Is that basically <laughs> what's happening here? The, uh, the United States Congress, uh, for all of the very good people who are in it, uh, is making itself more and more irrelevant uh, every day. The, um, the fact is that the president is doing things that are not within his constitutional authority. Uh, members of Congress complain uh, and just then let it go by. The, uh, uh, you know, I, <laughs> Uh, I, I'm now on the board of a group called the Project for Government Oversight, but uh, before I was on the board, I did a lot of speaking to members of Congress and to uh, uh, the staff members. Uh, and what would happen is they would be trying to find information out about you know what was going on in the administration, which I mean this was the Bush administration too, it's not not the Obama administration alone. Uh, and what they were doing, here's what members of Congress were doing to get information. They were filing Freedom of Information Act requests. And I said, yeah, you don't know, no, you're the Congress. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, you get it. And and in fact uh, uh, the last two presidents at least have gone quite far in um, uh, going beyond what their constitutional authority is, but that's because you know the, the Congress doesn't do anything about it. It doesn't uh, demand stuff. It doesn't say here's the penalty if you don't comply. Uh, so um, the president is doing what he can get away with. And on the Affordable Care Act, there have been a lot of changes that would ordinarily be changes that should be debated and either made or not made by the Congress. Uh, and the president has you know, seen problem areas, he's addressed them, uh, and Congress says, no, nobody's saying, no, wait, 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 that, that's our job, you know, and you can't do that. Julie, I, I would say, first of all, I think the ACA was a little unusual in that, in, in many, many ways, but uh, one was the, the amount of authority that Congress actually did delegate to the president of the administration, because they couldn't answer a lot of these questions, and they went, you know, I think they took Bill's admonition to heart, that obviously we can't know how some of these things are gonna play out. But that said, uh, there's, a, there's a huge chasm between the White House and the Congress. And because of the dysfunction in Congress, they become less and less relevant as a counterbalance to the White House as all of these issues are addressed, whether they have the authority or not. There's virtually no communication at all. And without communication, there can't be coordination. And uh, without coordination, there's no trust and no opportunity to govern. The world around us is changing. Technology is demanding that society move forward, and we're moving forward at a faster and faster pace. And when the Congress does nothing, somebody has to begin to act to respond to all of that change all around us, and the president's doing that. I don't, uh, that isn't to, to uh, embrace many of the decisions they've made with regard to how they've done it. I don't think the president has engaged Congress and the Republican leadership. I would, I would love to see the president meet once a week with, with, with leadership on both sides of the aisle to talk about what little things they could accomplish that particular week. I'd love to see him take them up to Camp David and spend a weekend getting to know them. So why, you know, he, he is a smart guy, and he is articulate guy, the president, not guy, the president of the United States. And, and I say this with <laughs> huge respect, and both, we uh, both served with him in, in the Senate. And, um, why doesn't he, why doesn't he just meet with leadership and have a conversation? 
Well, I think it, he thinks it's it's futile at this point, and I, I'm I'm disappointed. Yeah, but even yeah. early on, yeah. I, and I, I think he would be and have been one of the great presidents, and I say this honestly, if he just had a meeting with the former, uh, not the former, forget us, the leadership of the House and Senate on a regular basis for one hour, once every two weeks. And he, I'm not sure he refuses to do that, but as president, the most powerful man in the world to be able to sit down at a table with four people. I don't, it's no way, and this is optimism for me because it's not that complicated to fix this stuff. And I'm basically saying if you have a meeting with, with bringing people together, just five people, once every two weeks, the direction of the United States of America will change. But and I, it, well, go ahead. No, I don't, I don't, I, I don't no go ahead. I was just going to say, I, it's not just between the White House and the Congress. I, was, I had lunch with a few members of the Senate a couple of days ago, and I asked them, so when was the last time you had a joint caucus no, with I Republicans read. and Democrats in the Senate? Nobody could remember. <laughs> I asked them, so when was the last time you got together with the House of Representatives and all had this informal session saying, how are we gonna work through some of these but we things? we gotta do something about and that. And they said, you know what, we've never had that. In fact, one member of Congress said, in all of my career, I've never had a joint session between the House and the Senate on an informal basis. I mean, that is just ridiculous. Well, how the only change? time they how see each other is at the White House barbecue. That's right. Well, that, let me so, just on the healthcare thing, so President Obama, when you have one party in charge, and think about these next elections, because the next elections can fix a lot of this stuff, and we're probably not gonna to talk too much about that, but it really can, because elections are you telling the Congress, we want things different, and in 2016 for the presidency there, so you can, we can change all of that uh, coming in. But the, bill, the Health Care, the Affordable Care Act, was passed in a very unconventional way that you never used, I never used. We used it for taxes and all that. And it shows great leadership for what, for what Mickey said. In 40 years, 50 years, President Obama pulled off what nobody's been able to pull off. And in the net net, it's good. I mean, net net, it's good, uh, uh, but we gotta fix this stuff. The problem is the way it was passed with no Republican support because nobody sat around the table together and we gotta figure out how to fix that. It meant that it didn't go, nothing was fixed. It was a dirty bill, it hadn't been fixed. The fixing it of it, so it came out of a bill with all of this stuff wrong, it's like this patchwork of thing put together with all sorts of internal conflicts. And then you get to the fixing part of it, and as we've all said, it's not, or as you, Julie said, it's not being fixed. Why? Because when you're in the Congress and you go back to your district, and 60% of them basically say, we don't like, they don't know what it is, but nevertheless they say, we don't like the Affordable Care Act. You don't have to put President Obama's name in there. We don't like it then that gives me, the legislator, very little incentive to come in and do the work that was preempted uh, up, up front. And that's where we are today, a bill that can be shaped. And Tom and I uh, spend a lot of time talking together as part of the Bipartisan Policy Center, working how to shape it, debating, disagreeing, coming out, and that it can be fixed, but the legislative body is not gonna fix it. But that makes sense, that's logical, it's rational, because they didn't want it they didn't, they didn't pass it in a way that it could be fixed easily, and then their people are saying, don't touch the bill. Don't even bring it up. And so now what do we do? And now you've got a President of the United States, and this bill has good stuff in it. I mean, it's an access bill, it's not a cost bill, and costs are gonna go up, and we can talk about all that. But nevertheless, it, it addressed a major issue that nobody's been able to do. So how do we as an American people step up and help fix it? So the President's out there using these executive powers, I agree with Mickey, go beyond what is constitutional. He'll pull back a little bit, he'll have to pull back a little bit, but he has no choice. He has no choice, I think, and re as a responsibility of the American people. I, I do think there is one area where I think the uh, executive takes some of the blame here. Uh, during the Reagan years, uh, those of us in the leadership uh, met with the president every week. It wasn't every two weeks, we met every week. Uh, at, in the cabinet room, and it was uh, uh, usually it would be the Republican leadership meeting with him, but uh, uh, every once in a while, uh, it was not rare for uh, him to meet with Republican and Democratic leadership, uh, and he met in, in, in an open way. Uh, when, when the current president uh, reached out one time very publicly, you know, to meet with the Republican members, you know, he lectured them as though he was the teacher and they were the students, and uh, which is not quite the way the Constitution reads. And and he is a he, the president is very very uh, smart man, and and I think that uh, if he were more willing to engage, you know, not in 
pushing his point and, and uh, but, but listening to the people on the Hill, having real conversation uh, with people in both parties, you could make some real progress. All right, I'm going to open it up to the audience. We have just a few minutes left. Um, there, I think there are microphones going around. Question right there. Thank you. I'm Harvey Feinberg uh, from the Institute of Medicine. I'd like to raise two questions, one on the generic problem of dysfunction and one on future for health opportunity. The general question is this. Uh, California has adopted certain reforms. Uh, the so-called jungle primary in which the two leading vote getters are the finalists regardless of party and independent commissions for redistricting. Uh, I'd like to know your opinion of those two steps as whether positive, neutral, or negative, and also what ideas you have on finance reform, which was the third area of dysfunction that was mentioned. On the health area, my question is this. What would you recommend to the current leadership in Congress as the most promising, important need for health where you believe there could be bipartisan support mobilized as a next step in progress for health of the American people? Can I, can I take a first crack at the, the first part of it? Yeah, Just the first do. part. I can say it. um, it's not a jungle primary, it's a general election with a runoff. Uh, and uh, uh, Washington. You might want to explain it. For yeah, people yeah who don't well, know what, it is. What, what happens is it started in Washington State. Well, Louisiana's had a, had a while. In 2006, the voters in Washington State had an initiative petition uh, and they voted to do away with party primaries and to do away with party control of redistricting. So, and then in 2010, California did the same thing. So that what happens is uh, in both of those states, uh, everybody who is qualified to run for office, whatever the, the state laws are, appears on the same ballot, Republican, Democrat, Libertarian, Green, three Democrats, two Rep whatever. Uh, and every single eligible voter in the state is able to vote on that entire slate. And whoever gets, uh, whoever ends up in the top two, if nobody gets over 50%, uh, runs, uh, they run against each other even if they're two members of the same party. So here's a, a real live example of how that works. Uh, there was a, and I, I think this is absolutely what has to be done. Bills are being introduced uh, in Texas, Ohio, Arizona, other places to, to get rid of this party primary that allows our good friend Mike Castle in Delaware uh, to lose to Christine O'Donnell who only got 30,000 votes and he would have won statewide, but he wasn't even allowed to be on the ballot uh, under the, the sore loser laws now that we have in 46 states. So in California, you had two districts thrown together. Uh, and so Howard Berman and Brad Sherman, two liberal Democrats, were thrown into the same district. Uh, and they ended up as the top two. Before this change, it's a very liberal district. There was no way it was ever going to vote for a Republican. Uh, both, both of them would have been appealing to the left because that would have determined the outcome of, of their race against each other. Now they knew, running against each other, that the Republicans also got to vote in that race. The Libertarians, the Greens, the, the, everybody got to vote in that race. And now they found themselves not appealing to their hardcore party base, but to the entire electorate. And they had to broaden their message, be more, more inclusive in their message. So I think uh, on those, uh, changing, uh, allowing for nonpartisan independent commissions to do the redistricting instead of party leaders, uh, and allowing voters to choose among all of the alternatives. I call it democracy, and I think it's a much better idea than the current movement, the current way we do it, which was not in the Constitution, but came out of the populist movement of the late 1800s and early 1900s for some good reasons, but uh, the primary system is probably a bigger cause of the problems we have in government today than any other one thing. I, I, I agree completely with Mickey. I, 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 uh, the Bipartisan Policy Center just this week issued a whole series of recommendations and that was one of them. We very solidly endorsed uh, that concept. The other thing that we came out with that I, I hadn't thought of but it was generated in the discussion among the 29 participants is a national primary day. One of the problems we have is very, very low voter turnout in primaries. It's not unusual to be below 20% turnout. But a national primary day, a little bit like Super Tuesday, would generate a lot more interest and maybe a lot more turnout and participation. Uh, and then having early voting, 
uh, would allow people to participate if they weren't working. And we suggest moving the, the election day from Tuesday, which is a very difficult day for a lot of people to vote, to Saturday. So all kinds of ideas that might increase the level of participation that could go a long way to begin to address the problem that the primary system today presents uh, for, for Congress and the American people. With regard to financing, I, the other thing that's trending these days is everybody has a leadership pact. You get elected as a freshman congressman and the, one of the first things you do is create a leadership pact. You're not a leader. I, I would like to, I'd like to limit these leadership pacts to leaders, you know, and, and quit the money raising that way. I, I, you know, this is probably a stretch, but how about not allowing any fundraising while Congress is in session? Um, you know, oh, that would not go over well. No, it, won't, it won't happen, but uh, that's my wishful thinking list, I guess. But I mean, as long as money is viewed as speech uh, in the Supreme Court, it'll either take a constitutional amendment or, uh, or some dramatic change in the, in, the, in the court to bring about some different interpretation of how that's addressed. So you've got to come up with little things, incremental things, and those are my best uh, examples. The, um I'm glad we've spent time on the primary system. Just leave here knowing to capture what we feel in America where people want, not necessarily centrist views, but bipartisan, people coming together, civil discourse, debate, all the things that we represent here at the, at the Aspen Institute and, and the like. For that to happen, this has to be addressed, how people get elected. Once it is, I'm optimistic because our views, people's views will be reflected up in a great process of every two years in the House and every six years on the Senate, every four years of the presidency. It's, it's a great, great, great system. The second question, Harvey, I don't know exactly uh, what, where, where you were going with it, but as I look at healthcare specifically, if there was sort of one concept that I would like injected in everything today and didn't feel this way five years ago because we didn't have the information technology and we didn't have access to knowledge as, as uh, immediately as, as we do today. But the single most important central organizing principle in, in healthcare to me that would be the lever uh, that you could carry throughout, whether it's Medicare, Medicaid, government exchanges and the like, would be a focus on transparency. And I think the transparency can apply to hospitals and how much things cost and how much it is with physicians. And you don't have to get involved in the negotiations with payers so much. But it feeds a little bit on my second concept, not the alienation, but the populism. This feeling of, of individual, what's in it for me, a distrust of external institutions. The only way to get around that is, is fact, is science, is the truth, is how much things really cost. Spending versus cost you can talk about. The fact that we do have empowered consumers today, very high deductibles, um, uh, people are paying more attention, they can access information, and it's not real clean. We don't know exactly what quality is and, and all, but if we could get the price, because money is flowing, dollars can be counted. If we could get the transparency out there, I think with the empowerment of the consumer with knowledge and higher deductibles and the interest themselves, it would help drive everything in, in healthcare, health, healthcare today. Um, Again, that's sort of a general principle. And in, in terms of, of uh, changes in the system, this is where I'm probably different than everybody else on the panel. I think whether it's in Medicare or government or in the private world, a movement much more towards individual responsibility but in terms of dollar. And the only way to do that is instead of having an SGR, this is how much you're gonna get paid for this procedure and there are 10,000 procedures out there and here's a list of codes to come to a more, you can't use this politically, voucher approach, where you really are giving an individual a group of resources to make decisions, and if they can't make a decision, build a system around there that will help them, and then if they can't afford it, to come in with subsidies. And that's not what we did with the, uh, the Affordable Care Act. It didn't really change payment and payment mechanism, but I think as a trend, and if Republicans do take back the Senate, which they probably will, um, we don't know about what's going to happen with the White House. There'll be a move in that direction, a much more of a voucher approach to health care. I think we may have time for one more question. Patty Gabo, Denver. Uh, thank you. Uh, this was great. I wish you were all still in Congress. Uh, <laughs> but um, clearly, you're very thoughtful, very influential, and you raised two obvious solutions to help Congress work more, 
in Congress be there maybe 18 days a month instead of nine <laughs> and meet together. Surely, I know you must have talked to your colleagues who were there about this. This is something they can fix themselves. Doesn't require anybody else to do anything. So why can't they do those simple changes? And is there a way that we as you know, general citizens can help encourage them to do those two very, what seem simple things? Well, unfortunately, I, and Mickey, Mickey's a real student of this, and I would defer to him, but I think in addition to it being ideologically driven, there's a personality-driven problem today among the leaders, and it's just they have a hard time uh, relating. And uh, I mean, I had the really true good fortune to work with Bill, and, uh, and before him, Trent Lott and Bob Dole, and, and he's, a, he's become a very, Bill's a very dear friend. I, don't, I can't envision that Harry Reid and Mitch McConnell will ever find a time that they're going to be able to say that, unfortunately. So I think we have to, we have to figure out uh, a way, and I hope I'm wrong, maybe I am, but I, I think we have to figure out a way to, to get around that and, uh, and, and maybe cause the next tier of leadership to do a little bit more overt work and trying to bring everybody together. If it isn't gonna happen at the very top, maybe it can happen at the second or third tier levels. That is happening to a certain extent already, but not nearly, I think there's a, there's a peer pressure not to do it. If you get caught too much working with the Democrats or the Republicans, you may, you may get lugered, you, you may get a primary, and uh, people are very concerned about that. So they're keeping a lower profile for fear that somehow that's gonna get exposed and they're gonna look less ideological than they should. But the bottom line is that I think a lot of it's personality driven at the top and we've gotta get around that. And that's the, the leadership thing that I'm implying to, and we don't need to overstate it, but just our observations are, are that. Let me just add, Patty always comes to the sort of crux of the issue, so thanks for your question. Exactly. Uh, um, the, the one thing that we haven't talked, and Mickey, you thought a lot more about this than, than I have, but it leaves me more optimistic than pessimistic. Uh, the structural stuff, the institutional stuff, uh, we can, it's fix, it is fixable. Patty, it is, it is fixable. How we do it, we need to keep working on. The thing that I'm excited about is um, the potential of all of you and us uh, reaching the highest level without going through all of these, these levels of stuff. Julie interprets for all of us in an intelligible way sort of what's going on there. But with the power of social media, with the power of the internet, with the power of the devices and the things that we have on in terms of communication, I think in the next 10 years, in the political process, and we've seen hints of it before, the ability to bypass the lobbyists and the fluff and the, even the media and the slants of newspapers and having the individual be able to reach literally the leader of, of the Senate or the highest levels of the staff is going to, to, to have a huge impact. It may be negative, it may be messy, but the fact that each of us today, and there are apps that allow you to go and interpret not what somebody says, but actually how they vote with one click, and then on the next click to be able to write a letter directly to that senator or to that, that House member. I don't know exactly how it's going to work, but the power of the media to bypass all of these layers that separate the intimacy of the voter with the elected leader, to me, I'm very hopeful about. I don't know exactly how it's going to work, and, but I... I I feel it, I sense it, I look at the apps, I see what the, uh, the, the, the computer applications, I see what's actually out there today, and it leaves me pretty confident that that immediacy, once we reestablish re re it by fixing this electrical, electoral system itself, uh, but attaching to the, the, the voter and the American citizen out there, we're not gonna see this extreme partisanship and no discussion, because that's not what America is all about. It's not Democrat, Republican, it's not left, right, it's being an American, and that's what we feel, we just got to establish that connection. Uh, let, let, let me uh, just leave you with a, a quick story. Uh, so this whole idea about the reforms in, in the electoral system and the redistricting and, and even money, uh, I wrote about a couple of years ago uh, in, in one of my books. And one of the things that I said in the beginning was how I came to this point of view. Uh, so I was having a... Uh, neighborhood meeting uh, in my district in Oklahoma City. 
uh, and was asked why I had not done something, which I don't remember now what it was, but I hadn't, and, uh, and I'm a Republican. I was always in the minority every day I was in Congress, and so I did what politicians do. I said, well, I'm a Republican. The Democrats control the place. They won't allow us to bring up our amendments. They won't allow us to have our bills considered, whatever. Uh, and somebody stood up in the back of the room. There are probably about as many people as there are here. And somebody stood up in the back of the room and said, you know, I am so damn sick and tired of hearing Democrat this, Republican that, and everybody in the room stood up and cheered. And I never did it again. Now, the one thing that, that is true is that members of Congress are not afraid that they're going to get hit by a tank tomorrow or by a meteor. They're afraid of the voters. And I don't know how, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, I don't know how many of you show up when your member of Congress, House or Senate, uh, is in your community to have a town meeting. How many of you get your friends together and go and say, this is the change that we want, this is what we're looking for, we're going to hold you accountable for that. Ultimately, the power is in the people. Uh, and uh, complaining is not uh, a significant or, or helpful, uh, you know, part of, the, part of the process. You need to be heard. You need to meet with your members of the House and the Senate, and you need to be there with your friends, and you need to say, this is the kind of behavior that we expect of you, uh, and if you're not able to deliver it, you know, we'll find somebody who can. And that can change things faster than any of these other things we've talked about. So on that Thank you. Optimistic note. I feel much better. So thank our family very much.